This mini lesson is the first of several in which we will learn through a series of examples how to solve problems involving Newton's second law, and in so doing gain a greater intuition for what this law means and how it's used. First, let's review Newton's second law. It relates the motion of an object to its mass and to the external forces acting on it. More specifically, it relates the rate at which its motion changes to its mass and to the net force acting on it. Quantitatively, Newton's second law states that an object of mass m, subject to various forces, f1, f2, f3, and so on, will undergo an acceleration given by a equals f sub net divided by m, where the net force, defined by f sub net equals f1, plus f2, plus f3, plus dot, 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 is the vector sum of all forces acting on the object. Note that the acceleration vector A points in the same direction as the net force vector F sub net. Since Newton's second law relates an object's motion to the net force acting on it, we need to have a clear picture of all forces acting on an object, so that we can add them as vectors to find the net force. This picture is achieved through a special kind of figure called a free body diagram, and it is the starting point for all problems involving applications of Newton's second law. To draw a free body diagram, follow these steps. First, select an object of interest in the problem at hand. Some problems will have only one object of interest, whereas others may have multiple objects you will need to draw a free body diagram for each object individually. Next, for the object chosen, identify all forces acting on it, whether exerted by other objects in the problem or some external agent such as gravity. The third step is to draw a coordinate system. This can be the usual type with the x-axis horizontal and the y-axis vertical or it may be convenient for the problem at hand to orient the axes in a different direction. That's fine. Just make sure that you draw both axes and that they're perpendicular to each other. Incidentally, I advise you to draw a nice large diagram. Some students seem timid and make tiny little diagrams with ambiguous features, rendering the diagram all but useless. Be confident and careful in your drawings and you'll find them to be much more useful in setting up and solving problems. Regardless of what the object is, represent it on your free body diagram as a dot, and place it at the origin of the axes you just drew. Again, don't be timid. Make it a nice big dot. For each force you identified in step 2, Draw a vector representing that force with its tail on the object, i.e. the dot, pointing in the direction of the force and of length proportional to the strength of the force. In some problems, you may not know the direction or strength of a given force. That may be one of the things the problem asks you to compute. No matter, just draw a, in a vector representing the force in a reasonable direction and of a reasonable length bearing in mind that this representation is provisional. Make sure you label each vector. Give it a sensible label and always put an arrow on the symbol, or bold-faced if you're typesetting it. It is a vector after all. Finally, to the side, draw the net force vector by adding all of the force vectors from step 4 and label it F sub net. The reason we draw it to the side rather than attach to the dot is to help us avoid confusing it as yet another force acting on the object. It isn't. It's the aggregate of all of the forces. To include it as an additional force would be like double counting all of the forces, and we don't want to do that. Another way to help avoid confusion is to draw the net force vector in a different color if you can. Okay, let's put this procedure to practice with an example problem. A two kilogram hanging lantern is suspended at rest from the ceiling, of, uh, from the ceiling by two cables 
one, one at an angle of 57 degrees clockwise from vertical, and the other at an angle of 32 degrees counterclockwise from vertical. Assuming the cables have negligible mass, what is the tension in each? As an aside, let me mention that a, a lot of physics problems, especially at the introductory level, involve ropes, cables, rods, springs, pulleys, and so forth, with negligible mass, or even zero mass. Clearly, this is just a simplifying assumption, as real ropes, and rods, and so forth, do have noticeable mass. It is possible to solve problems with realistic ropes, cables, pulleys, and so on, all having non-negligible mass, but those problems are a good deal more complicated, and so they're not appropriate when first learning physics. Besides, it often is a good approximation to ignore the mass of the ropes, cables, and so forth, when the object of interest is much more massive. Okay, now back to the problem. As always, it's best to start with a sketch of the scenario described in the problem. This sketch is not a free body diagram. To get that, let's follow the steps in the previous slide. First, we select an object of interest. In this case, case it's clearly the lantern. Next, we identify the forces acting on the lantern. The tension in cable 1 exerts a force on the lantern. Likewise for cable 2. And finally, there's the force of the Earth's gravity pulling down on the lantern, which we call its weight. Based on what we can glean from the problem, these are the only three forces acting on the lantern. The next step is to draw a coordinate system. We do not draw the free body diagram on our original sketch. We draw it off on its own as a free body. We represent the lantern as a dot at the origin. And we draw in and label vectors for the three forces. Notice that we know the directions of all three force vectors, and we know the magnitude of the weight vector. That's just mg. But we don't know the magnitudes of the two tension forces, F1 and F2. So I just made an educated provisional, provisional guess as to how long to make those two arrows. The precise magnitudes will come out in the math. Finally, we draw the net force vector off to the side. Since we're told the lantern is hanging at rest, we know from Newton's first law that the net force is zero. There's no way to draw a vector of length zero, so instead I just wrote F net equals zero for this final step. Now that we have a good free body diagram, we want to use it to solve the problem. But what do we do next? A big hint comes from the previous statement. Since the object is at rest, Newton's first law tells us that the net force acting on it is zero. When the net force on an object is zero, the object is said to be in equilibrium. According to Newton's second law, a zero net force means that the acceleration is zero, which means that the velocity is unchanging. That could mean that the object is stationary, in which we call it static equilibrium, or it could mean that the object is moving at constant velocity, both speed and direction, in which case we call it dynamic equilibrium. Doesn't matter. From a Newtonian perspective, these two cases are equivalent, and the technique for solving equilibrium problems is the same no matter, no matter whether it's a static or dynamic equilibrium. But what is the technique for solving equilibrium problems? Well, actually, it's quite systematic and straightforward. First, you draw a free body diagram for the object of interest. Once you've done that, and you have a coordinate system, because that's part of the free body diagram, you resolve each force vector on the diagram into x and y components. That's why you bothered to draw the coordinate axes. Add up the x components of all of the forces and set them equal to zero. Like so. Undoubtedly, one or more of the terms will involve unknowns to be solved for. Do the same for the y components. That gives a second equation. So there had better be just two unknowns, unless you have a third equation to write down as well. <laughs> 
Finally, solve these two equations for the unknowns using ordinary algebra. Let's apply this technique to the lantern problem. We already have the free body diagram. Next, we resolve each of the forces into x and y components. For the F1 force, the x component is opposite the 57 degree angle and the y component is adjacent. So F1x is equal to the magnitude F1 times sine of 57 degrees and F1y is equal to F1 times cosine of 57 degrees where F1 is the unknown magnitude of the F1 vector. Similarly, the F2 force is treated in the exact same way. However, notice that the x component of F2 points in the negative x direction. So we have to remember to make F sub 2x negative. Finally, the weight has no x component and the y component is minus g. Now we write down the equilibrium equations adding up the x components and setting the sum to zero and doing likewise for the y components. Notice that these two equations have two unknowns, F1 and F2, the tension in each cable. This is precisely what the problem asks us to find. So now all we have to do is algebra, solving two simple equations for the two unknowns. I use the first equation to solve for F2 in terms of F1, and then I substituted the result into the second equation, leaving F1 as the only unknown in that equation. Plugging in numbers and solving for F1 gives F1 equals 10.4 newtons, and then plugging that value back into the very first equation gives F2 equals 16.4 newtons. And finally, we summarize. The tension in cable 1 is 10.4 newtons, the tension in cable 2 is 16.4 newtons, and the weight of the lantern, mg, is 9.6 newtons. Now we have to stop and ask, is this a reasonable result? Well, it makes sense that F2 would be larger than F1. Since cable 2 is closer to being vertical than cable 1 is, it should be supporting more of the weight. You can see that has to be true by considering the limiting case of cable 2 being completely vertical and cable 1 being completely horizontal. In that limiting case, cable 2 would support all of the weight and cable 1 would just sit there limp. Another way to make sense out of the fact that F2 is greater than F1 is by realizing that they are the only things producing horizontal forces. So since the net horizontal force has to be zero, the x components of each have to be equal and opposite. But a greater percentage of F1 is horizontal. So in order for F2 to make up for that, its magnitude must be greater. Finally, we would expect both F1 and F2 to be smaller than the lantern's weight, since each one contributes an upward y component to support the weight of the lantern. And indeed, F1 and F2 are both smaller than the weight of the lantern. These qualitative checks all confirm the reasonableness of our answers.